Yo, what's cracking, my people? What is up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome to yet another episode of ADQ's Renaissance. I'm your host with the most. Keep it 100 from coast to coast. Through God, I boast. ADQ. I'm a li- y'all go ahead and sign on up in here. Wh- whichever one of y'all are not working. If you are working and you are watching this on your phone or whatever, shame on you. Shame on you. I am judging. Shame on you. Anyway. Welcome to ADQ's Renaissance. I'm your boy, A-D-Q. You are tuning in to a rare afternoon episode of ADQ's Renaissance, you know, because my, 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 my I'm going to call her my guest host, slash my guest, slash my um, fellow conversationalist. You know, she's a very, very, very busy woman, so we were grateful, I was grateful to have the get, you know, Get this time with her. So, <clears throat> first of all, first of all, for those of y'all who will end up watching this, or who will end up listening to this, if you are in North Carolina, if you are in the surrounding territory or area, Battle of the Books, March 19th, 2022. Battle of the Books, March 19th, 2022. Making your business to come through. You know what I'm saying? Van Dyke Performance Center. Tickets can be tickets can be purchased at um https colon slash slash adq battle of the books one word that dot eventbrite.com. Check out Black Tony Soprano. Look out for Street Logic. All of these are projects that I'm involved in because you know I'm just dope. Shout out to my homie, little homie Caleb Kurtz. Um, our film, The Talk of Peace. Has been is currently being viewed in Hollywood, bro. Hollywood. Who got producer credit on it? Your boy. Who um who acted in it and was acting crazy? Your boy. Hopefully, y'all be able to watch it one day. Now, enough about me. Let's talk about my guest. My guest, her voice has been hailed as having a rich core with a sparkling bloom in his upper register. She has a bachelor and master and master of music degrees from Appalachian State University. That's right, Appalachian. You know what I'm saying? She was in Boone and is a doc and was a doctoral candidate at West Virginia University. Her favorite roles while in school have been Loretta Gian from Gianna Skiki. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Rose Marat in Street Scene and Anna One in Seven Daily Sins. Miss Greco has had the privilege to perform principal roles in many of Mozart's most famous operas with blooming vo- uh, voice summer opera in Die Zoberfloat and Portland summer opera Le Nozzi di Figaro. That's right. That's right. She's heavy in the, in the opera world. You know what I'm saying? She's heavy in the opera world. And in Toronto, Toronto, she's been doing Canada stuff. Uh, summer opera, Don Giovanni. She also enjoys doing outreach work with West Virginia Opera on Wheels. And, you know, right now she's holding down Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Her regional credits include Eugene Wongin as Tatiana La Rodine, Bianca Gianna, um, Gianna Skiki as Loretta, uh, HMS Pinafore Pen, as Josephine and Grant and the Grand Duke as Julia Yeoman of the Guard as El, as Elise Maynard the Gondoliers as Jean, 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 Gianetta and the Enchanted Forest as the Soprano and Lee Lover. Woo! That gone! This young lady is accomplished, bruh! You know she's only 34. Yeah, she's only 34, man. And she done all this. And recently, she made her Czech language debut singing Lenzi, Lesni Zinki in Viva, Vivaci Opera's production of Rusaka in Vancouver, British Canada, in the British Columbia. Yes, where the Grizzlies used to play. And she was a resident artist with Finger, Le- Finger Lakes Opera in Canada, Canada in New York. But not the real New York, from what New Yorkers say. Not uh, you know, Manhattan, all that. Yo, she was a guest soloist with the Winston Salem Girls Chorus, and that's how she came into my periphery. Yo, 
Um, we were both in a production of Susical where she portrayed Gertrude McFuzz. Susical, this was a little theater in Winston Salem production of Susical way back when I was when I had less weight and way less hair. She was Gertrude McFuzz, and I was making my musical theater debut as a Jungle Citizen. That was way back in 2008. Can't believe it's been 14 years. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to ADQ's Renaissance, Miss Karen Alexis Greco. Karen, what's up? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, um, sound effects of all the good stuff. What's up? Hey, you did great with the Italian. Really, I read all that perfectly because I because I don't want anybody who's actually Italian to look at that and be like, "Hey, I don't like how that guy is messing up my beautiful language." We'll work on it. We'll work on it. <laughs> yes, work on it. Work on it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So how are you doing this fine uh, Thursday afternoon? Oh, you know, I'm good. I've I've already done a job interview today and just been hanging out since. Job interview? Job interview? Job interview? You don't mind me asking? Job interview for what? Uh, for a teaching job. Teaching? Oh, teaching? Mm-hmm. I'm, this is going to be... Uh, You know how people say that there's no such thing as a stupid question? There isn't. Yes, there is, because I'm about to ask you a stupid question. Okay. Um. And exactly what will you be teaching? Voice. I knew you'd be playing teaching either voice, how to manage the octaves, or something musical. So, you know, I knew that, but you know, it's it's some it's not it's not a good idea to make assumptions. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Yeah, I'll be teaching people how to sing, hopefully. So okay, okay. Are you teaching people how to sing someone who can like carry a note, someone who can do a couple do re mis, or are you like st uh, starting from the roots with them? Um, from so, with some students, it's starting at step one, right? Just like let's match pitches, and with some students, it's kind of fine tuning what they already have and working on solidifying their their technique and getting more into how they're characterizing whatever song they're singing and how to put emotion into the sound. Okay. So I'm going to run across, I'm going to run a couple of theories about voice, about mm -hmm. voice singing that I've heard over the years. And I want you to clarify for me whether they're true or not. I heard that coughing is murder on the vocal cords. Is that that right? is true. It's not very good for them. Obviously, it's something we can't help. Um, but coughing and clearing your throat are not very good for your vocal folds. Is that why my voice over the past couple of years has went from la to la? Uh, 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 la uh, uh. Um, maybe I don't know. <laughs> Let's it, see. it has to be very kind of like um long long term coughing and kind of very and and clearing your throat and pretty violent for it to to have any kind of lasting or major effect on the vocal cords. How uh let's see um I remember I was once in this play uh over at Theater Lines called Back to the 80s mm -hmm. way back in the day, right? People were there were a few people in the cast who had throat problems, and one lady, I think her name was Charlene Bray, was like, you know, praying over their throats and stuff, uh, uh, speaking speaking great positivity and vibes over their throats. Does that does that does that work? I mean, if you think it works, like I I think that that's you know it's that's mind tricks sometimes, kind of manifesting, putting some positive vibes in there. Um, but from a, a science perspective, not really. Okay. But from a, a mental perspective, absolutely, that can work. Okay. Um, what is the best way? What is the best way long term for someone to take care of their voice? Ooh. Um. Drink a lot of water. Stay hydrated. A lot of water. Yeah. Uh, so stay hydrated externally by drinking water, but also stay hydrated internally. So, um, steaming. Um, so I have, do I have that? I don't have that in here with me, but I've got like a steamer that I'll just breathe in steam for like 15 minutes. 
a day to get moisture right onto the vocal cords, uh, which is really good for them. Mm -hmm. um, getting a lot of rest, a healthy diet. Um, What's rest? What is rest? That was a good question. <laughs> That's the hard part for, I think, everyone is making sure you get the rest you need. Um, and just, and realizing what, um, what kind of things affect your body. Like, um, for some people, alcohol really affects their vocal cords and their ability to sing. For some people, it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. is, does it affect it for the, mm or for the, mm? uh, for the, mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like for me, I have to, I have to cut down on, on alcohol consumption about a week or two before I uh, have to do a gig just because I don't want to, it's, it's drying and it's just not a, not a good time for me personally, for other people, I have friends that like can drink right before they go on stage and they're totally fine. So it depends on the person, but the main ones are hydration, rest and diet to keep, keep everything healthy. Okay, so um, so people people tell people tell me a lot. Oh, you done this. Oh, you done that. But sheesh, read your resume. Oh my goodness, you've been killing the game from from sea to shining sea. Trying. <laughs> you uh, the, 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 you got me. You got me like okay, man. I need to set my game up. I mean, oh. I ain't no, I ain't no opera singer, but you know. We crossed past theatrically. We're gonna get we're gonna get into that in a minute. But to me, everything has a beginning. So I will ask you, at what point did at what point did you say, Mommy, Daddy, I like singing? I'm going to now I want to assume, we which we which we both uh, agree that it's not good to assume, but I assume a lot. I feel like a Lutheran church choir has something to do with it, but I'm gonna let you the story go ahead yeah um yeah well i i always you know i don't know the moment that i was like i really like singing i started taking vo voice lessons and i use that term very lightly um when i was in like fourth grade and it was more of like teaching me how to read music and let's just sing a bunch of Disney songs kind of thing. It wasn't really, it was more like a music lesson than anything else. Um, and that's when I kind of, I guess figured out I liked singing. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really get into it until when I moved to um, Winston Salem and the church that my parents went to, they, wow. um, they, there, there was a, they were starting a um, middle to high school aged choir. And so I helped start that. And then that just kind of, I feel like that. And then um, I was a member of the, the Central Carolina Children's Chorus, which is now the Winston-Salem Girls Choir. Um, I was a member of that at the same time. And those two, I think, together kind of made me realize that this is something I like to do. And I didn't know that I could do it professionally or for a living at all but it was just something that I enjoyed and knew that I was gonna at least be involved in music at, in some way throughout my entire life well um that was definitely a like manifestation <laughs> thinking uh thinking I don't know what you I don't know where your I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are but um, that's definitely some law of attraction. I think I speak, I am type stuff because you know, again, you're killing the game from C to uh, C. <laughs> well, can I tell you? This is a funny anecdote, actually. What's up? Uh, not really funny. I think it's funny. Um, so when I was taking those music lessons when I was in fourth grade, I this is when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and they were auditioning for um, the movie Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And so I went and auditioned to be one of the the three or four or five, however many there are, little girls, his his mm -hmm. daughters. Um, and so we were asked to, you know, line up and we had to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And I didn't get obviously I didn't get cast. And I remember being like, 
mom this is like I was like mom they picked the kids that couldn't sing very well and so I immediately was like I suck like I'm never gonna get any like I'm never gonna do anything like no one ever is gonna want me to do anything and the more I thought about it, the more I was like oh th these these I it was mainly because I didn't have a southern accent when I sang so all the girls that got picked were twinkle twinkle little star and I was I'm from <laughs> West, so I was like twinkle twinkle little star and that just didn't fit the what they were going for but I was like I'm never gonna do anything in my life <laughs> it was funny you that is funny because you didn't have a sudden accent yet you were raised in North Carolina this was time in Tennessee this was time in West Virginia so you sure no got you sure no got an accent in your bag don't you Oh, I can whip one out. I'm from the Midwest, so like I, I was born and learned how to talk in the Midwest. So that's always stuck with me more than my entire life in the South. When you got to Pittsburgh, did when you got to Pittsburgh, did they say that you sound Southern or did they just look at you and say, Hey, you don't sound like you're from around here? Uh no, because there are people with southern accents here, what? um, heavier than than in North Carolina. No. Yeah, and Pittsburgh has their own accent. It's called Pittsburghese, and it's um they have their own weird dialect and accent here. Um, that's very very strange. <laughs> so, so I'm learning it still. So when I hear Pittsburgh, I think of an old co. I would think of a former co-worker. I think of the Steelers. Uh -huh. I think of uh Kurt Angle. Mm -hmm. So maybe through one of those, I'll manage to catch how Pittsburgh, Pitts, Pittsburghians talk. There, there is someone that I'll, I don't know, am I allowed to like say a, a content creator? Yes, you can. This is, so Pittsburgh dad, he's on YouTube and Instagram, whatever. He has, I think the like perfect Pittsburgh accent down. Pittsburgh dad. Pittsburgh dad. Pittsburgh dad. If I ever, if I ever visit Pittsburgh, I will make sure, I will make sure to remember that. Yeah. Now, now I want to, now I want to ask you, like, when I was reading your whole resume and all of the things that you have accomplished, and sheesh, and only and only uh I'm uh, I hope you don't I hope you didn't mind me uh saying it saying your age. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> okay, in 34 years on this earth, man, a uh, applause round of applause. Oh, okay. I saw a whole lot of operatic pieces, but you know, theater, the, 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 the theater is where we do our thing on on this particular platform. Um, what are some like theater pieces that you've uh, been involved in? Oh gosh! Um, Dang, so that mean we did we did musical together. I've never actually done a a straight play ever. Um, what? Yeah, it actually terrifies me to memorize lines because we don't have to do that in opera. <laughs> we don't have spoken words most of the time. Um, <laughs> we do a little bit, but most of the time we don't. Um, I've never done a straight play, so I. Um, I'm trying to think of what I did after we did Seussical. And I don't, oh gosh, what was, what, was the, what was the last musical I did? I did a lot of operetta. So like a lot of um, like Gilbert and Sullivan stuff, which mm -hmm. is, is kind of going more towards traditional musical theater. Um and that's that's it. I did a lot of musical theater in in high school, um, middle school and high school, and the beginning of college. But once I kind of discovered opera, I kind of left musical theater behind for a long time, <laughs> long time. So musical was kind of like your re-entry into musical theater. It was like I think the last time I did a musical. Like a traditional musical. <laughs> so, so the crazy thing about that is, the last time I did a musical was this was 2017. This play called Barnum. Mm -hmm. Um, Susical was my re-entry into theater. 
before Suits to Cold, I haven't done not a single play in like six years, right? So when I walked into Suits to Cold, I was scared to death. I'm like, oh my God, I got to get around all these white people in sin. <laughs> Sheesh. <laughs> Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, he, you want to talk about scared frame because for one thing, I came in the susicle out of the Christian hip hop world, right? So I was used to being, I was used to going, yo, 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 Jesus, real, Jesus, real dope. Um, I, uh, I was like, oh, you think you can think when you think about what the heck? Okay, I think I could do this. I think I could do this. And we did it. It, uh, yo, I, er, ever since then, every single musical that I'm in, I ask myself, will it be as great as Susical? Uh, it was a good time. Susical was a good time. Okay, it was a good time for you, but it was a great time for me. <laughs> Susical broke my theater virginity. Can I <laughs> theater virginity? Yeah, I can. It, it broke my theater virginity. Right. You'll always remember. I will for I will remember forever and ever, especially that. Um, I don't know about you, but my favorite number was Sala Salute. Oh yeah, that was really pretty. I didn't get it's, to sing that one, but it was really pretty. <laughs> oh my god, I'm sorry, Salute. I know. I was always jealous. I was always backstage, kind of humming along. I was jealous because y'all did the whole anything's possible joint, and I wasn't in it. <laughs> no, I no. uh but but over but overall yeah great time I wore a, I wore a ridiculous looking wig <sighs> same <laughs> oh you wore that Gertrude McFuzz oh, wig I mean if I, if, if I remember it was like it wasn't it like this color it was Carolina blue yeah yeah but oh yeah <laughs> Oh dang! The crazy thing is, the crazy thing is, I actually just recently, like last year, worked with Bobby Bofford again. Oh, how's he doing? Um, uh, he seems to be doing good. He seems to do, be doing good. Uh, still got that magic touch. But yeah, we worked together yeah. for this murder mystery over at a uh, community theater of Greensboro called uh, Mayhem at the Masquerade. Yeah. I looked at him. I was like, Bobby. What took us so long to reunite? Yeah. That's but, awesome. I ran into someone from that show years ago, randomly at an Indian restaurant. Um, I, th I think it was maybe the scenic designer. Maybe. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting. Um, that, that, I have but, no idea uh, what you're talking about. I, it, it was like, it was a, a strange moment, but they said that they still kept up with Bobby and that that he was doing good, so I'm glad to hear that. That for yeah, you, yeah. you got to work with him. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would a I would ask you out of all of the musical theater joints that you that you, that you did in high school, what are the ones that you what are the ones that you do remember doing? Um, I did the pajama game. Okay. Pajama game. High school. Um, I was one of the stepsisters in Into the Woods, but it never happened. So <laughs> we learned it and it never happened. So I don't really count that as anything. Oh. Um, so Dang, that's pretty... sad. I know, I know. All right, Did then. I forgive her or show her disdain? How yes. could she run from me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agony. Mine was never wear moth to a ball. That was my line. Um, and then we did, what did we do after that? Uh, we did Fame. Fame, Fame. Yeah. Don't know those songs, but cool. Um, and then we did Big River, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Big, Big River. Isn't that like Huck Finn? Uh, yes. No. Yeah, oh, yeah. Good job. I gotta high five myself. Oh, you too. I'm high fiving you. Nah, That's thank awesome. You. No one knows that musical, so it was awesome. Well, you know, I think of Big River. I'm thinking, okay, that's Huck Finn, 
him and Jim singing yeah. about how they're trying to get to where they're trying to go. Uh huh. And oh my gosh, the man that played Jim was fantastic. I oh my god, he was a senior when I was a freshman, so I sadly don't remember his name. But he was a fantastic person and performer, and gave the best hugs. Awesome. Okay, well, just for that, just for that, <clears throat> uh, just for that, next time I see you, I'm, uh -huh. going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to top that, yo. Okay. <laughs> Challenge. Challenge accepted. The crazy thing is, Jim, though I'm not particularly keen on um, any slave slave uh, films or anything, yeah. I wouldn't mind playing play Jim. Because... I just saw Courtney Vance play Jim um, in the Elijah in the Elijah Wood version of Huck, of Huck Finn. I was like, hmm, I think I could do that. I know I could do that. We're manifesting it. We're manifesting it. That's right. It's happening. So, okay, so we're talk. So we were talking about musical theater. You said that you you said there's a lot of similarities between musical theater and opera, right? Mm -hmm. I know when I think of uh, the first ever black uh, musical uh, piece, um, I think it's Clorindy, Clorindy, something like that. I, dang! Oh my goodness, my my mind just went my mind just went um 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 blank. I'll tell you what, I know when I think about one of the first ones, Porgy and Bess, it sounds very operatic, especially when they do the uh, I Got Plenty of Nothing joint. It's like the well, I Got Plenty, plenty of Nothing. nothing. So what? Yeah, it's considered an opera. It's, okay. Come yeah, there is, I believe, there is a musical theater rewrite version of it, um, but it did it did start out and it's still performed as as an opera. Okay. Um, and I remember one. I remember once uh, when I was like on a bit of a late Miz craze, right? Uh -huh. I was like, "Yo, man, late Miz is dope musical. It's incredible musical." And someone said, uh, "Adrian, that's an opera." No, it's a musical. It's a musical. Yeah. Isn't so, it? so here's here's the thing. Okay, so I'm sure people consider it an opera because there's not a lot of spoken lines. It's a song but, through a musical, basically. It's a song through a musical, but it's a the styles are different, and the the sing the, specifically the singing style is different from Les Mis to opera. Well, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Because if it was operatic, uh, Javert would be like, "Here I stand by the star. Here I swear by the stars." Yeah. Instead of the way Philip Quest and uh, 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 Russell Crowe and other <laughs> Javers did, right? Yeah. It's a little more, um, without getting too, like, technical. So in, technical. Shoot, we learned yeah, something. Right <laughs> so in musical theater, in that style, there's, um, there's belting, there's... Um, a mix and then there's a the legit sound and the legit sound is closest to what you would think of when you would hear opera but it's not the same thing um mainly the um resonating space is a little bit different and what is what is being used to resonate the sound in your face so it's a little different. In opera, it's a lot more open, and you have to use a lot more of your resonances to um, project because we don't use microphones for anything. Oh my goodness! Whenever someone, whenever I'm in a play and someone comes at me with a microphone, I'm like, man, get that out of my face! <laughs> I am a traditionalist in many things, um, but. I just think about okay. Here's why. Here's why I kept from. Here's what I keep from uh, Shakespeare days. Standing before five hundred people and being able to articulate in a way that they can hear every every single word. Mm -hmm. The whole uh, the whole um, little boys playing uh, playing women part that I can't rock with. 
that would that would have me a, that would make me an out of work actor. Like, <laughs> you want me to do what? No, we still do that in opera, although it's women playing men's parts. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. We still do it if like it needs to be like a um, like a younger boy because children shouldn't sing opera. Um, it's not healthy. <laughs> They can, they, can go, they can go high with a little with the undeveloped voices, I but they will not carry know. over. A, they won't carry what? over a one hundred to two hundred piece orchestra. That's the problem. They they can't. Oh. The the how that all works is just not healthy for for their voices. So women play those roles. I've played a a, a boy before. Well, um. <laughs> That sounds like something that occurs in opera and uh and in some of our favorite TV shows. Mm -hmm. Like I remember, like like uh, you remember how back in the nineties, Rugrats was like you know the itch, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine how surprised I was when I found out that Tommy, Chucky, Phil, all of them were all played by women. Yeah, I was surprised. Yeah. And right now, these days, I'm like, yo bow down to the feet of Regina King because we've seen all of the live actions joints that we did. Mm -hmm. But when you watch Boondocks and see her as Huey and Riley, two boys, I'm like, oh my goodness. Yep. So any so um any one anytime a woman um uh, can step into those shoes, hey, hats all to you. Hats all to you. You've played, so you played a, you played a boy before. I once played a woman, and I looked super, super, super crazy, ugly, and that's never happening again. <laughs> the good thing, though, is, is that this can happen, and it's not because of societal requirements. It's mostly for requirements of the play or or requirements of the of the voice it's not because in shakespeare time women just weren't allowed to to be on a stage that was that wasn't considered proper so so men stepped in so luckily it's not because of that have you ever had to if you don't mind me asking uh i want to ask a couple of heavy joints now sure. have you ever had to deal with anything like that like you know um Gender biases and things, things like that nature, things of that nature. Oh gosh, yeah, yes. Oh yeah, all the time. I'm not talking about just in life. I'm talking about like in in uh in in, in the arts. And, well, sure, yeah. Period. Yeah, there's rampant sexism and ageism in the uh, opera world and in the musical theater world. Dang. Rampant. Dang. They've been they're coming, they're coming for you like that. Mm-hmm. Sheesh. Okay. I asked because um ever so often, ever so often while I'm joke while I'm joking and I say whatever, um someone has to say someone has to say, someone will uh this like I say ever so often, not all the time, but someone will say uh that's sexist or whatever. I'm like Oh dang! I ain't trying to be sexist. I ain't trying to be sexist. I'm not a sex. I'm not a sexist person. Person, person, person. And um, it, and yo, if you don't mind educating me real quick, what the what does that look like? Like last night, I'll tell you this. Last night, I was hanging out with a girl that I'm trying to holla at. Right? She was laughing when I said, "May I have con uh I will may I would like to request consent to put my arm around you. Do I have consent? Yes or no?" And she laughed about that. "Do I have consent to hold your hand?" I think that's good. I'm telling you, I come I come I was raised in a very very conser in a very conservative city, Shelby, North Carolina. Mhm. Mm um, I won't be surprised if come elections, election season, I walk, I went there and saw a whole bunch of MAGA hats running around the place, whatever. Um, so I will say that there, that there is some, there is elements of conservatism to me, but I ain't out here trying to tell, I ain't out here trying to tell anybody how to live their life, how, what to do with their body. 
and trying to disrespect someone because they are a specific gender. That, you know, it just goes to the golden rule. Do others how you want others to do yourself. Mm -hmm. But as we are in cancel cold, as we are in cancel culture, it's like there's a new way to offend someone every time. But you being a logically thinking person, as I know you are, what does sexism look like to anyone who wouldn't know? Um, really, uh, it's it's something. It can be so simple as, and this is something that I I uh, I notice a lot being around college age students a lot. Um, where you know, if if someone needs something moved, they'll say, "Hey, I need three strong men." No one ever, ever asks women to help move something, ever. And, and I will tell you this, full stop, my husband does the same thing and it drives me nuts. I'm like, there are 10 strong women in this room. Can you just ask that, say you need three people to help you move something instead mm -hmm. of three strong men? Because women can pick it up as well. We, have, we, we also have upper body strength. Um, yes. So it can be something like that. Um, it could be something as as and, and this this is a lot of it is is how how it is perceived by the person that it's affecting. So somebody talking down um, or thinking like I I get a lot of people like oh you're a doctor really and you're how I mean, old really. So I get, I get a lot of like, um, people don't believe that I have a doctorate and that I, I have authority on a subject, um, or they don't believe me when I, I say something, I always get questioned. Um, so things like that will happen in the opera world. It manifests in, um, in it's difficult for women who are married to get hired because they are seen as not taking their career seriously. Um, women who are pregnant get, will not get cast or will get um, pushed out of a role because they are pregnant. Um, we are, critics usually are a little bit more critical of how we look and will write about how we look um physically instead of what our portrayal of the character or what our voice was like we get we get um critiqued on our or how we look on our weight on how much makeup we're wearing on if we should be wearing a costume like that or not things like that and that that never happens to men I've, very rarely does that happen to men um when I, next time i criticize someone i'll be like yo that dude fat yo <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's mostly like the people writing like in magazines and newspapers they focus on how the women look and then they focus on the men's talent um, so it's it, it'll manifest like that a lot um, and then the uh, the ageism kind of ties into the sexism a little bit because it's um, in a lot of competitions like I'm considered old for the opera world you don't um, look any different than you did back in the Gertrude McBuzz joint days. Um, I'm as 34. I'm considered old. The characters I play are like 16 years old, but 16 year olds cannot sing this music. Um, so you have to get people older. So they're wanting younger people to be singing music, and that's kind of detrimental to their their voices in the long run. Um, but besides that, in a lot of competitions there will be age limits and the women's age limit will be like 30. And then the men's age limit will be like 35, 40. There's no difference in like, like why, why, why that five to 10 year difference? There's absolutely no difference in the voice. And actually women's voices, um, especially if they're larger voices tend to mature a little bit later. So if anything, it should be, flipped to to make it fair for vocal development um mm. 
but that happens a lot where, you know, women are, are, our age, uh, limit is cut off far, far earlier than men's, which I think goes to a, we want you to look as young as possible and the voice isn't as developed. So, you know, if you're in a competition with a 30 year old woman versus like a 40 year old man, the voices aren't the same. The voices aren't developed as much. Well, I can say that um, if I want to get into the opera world, I better get to get them or else I'm or else shoot, because I got I got three years. <laughs> Age is competitions. So what? That's just for competitions. Well, uh, competitions are you know whatever. I don't do a lot of those because I'm I'm obviously I'm too old to do them now. So. But you you re you realize that. You realize that, okay, I'm 36. I'll be 37 in September. I know mm -hmm. I don't look it. But you realize that our 30s are, is different than the previous generation's 30s, right? Oh, yeah. Like, these days, you know, you're youthful until you hit that on 60, <laughs> 70. Yeah. I mean, I heard Bernie Sanders being jokingly referred to as a millennial. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so, but also ageism is, is, is crazy because there's like this, there's like this, um, uh, the societal limit. You have to have this, then the third by the time you hit a certain age. Yeah. So that's who. Exactly. Exactly. Like I remember when someone said to me, um, well, you don't have no kids. Well, you ain't married. What? I'm like, yeah, I mean, number one, I couldn't do what I do if I had kids. I mean, one day, but not two day. And married, I mean, shoot. These um from my from my from my perspective, these women are crazy out here. <laughs> Mind you, I said from my perspective. See? Yes. <laughs> good, good job. <laughs> but um but yeah, I ask you that because I want to do all that I can do. I want to do all that I can do to eliminate any sexist characteristics about myself that I have. That's good. That's good to like ask that kind of stuff and to try and be aware. It's, it's, I mean, it's the same with like anything. It's just awareness of how you're you're talking to people and, and existing in the world. Really, I think. So just just to apply sexism, it applies to anything, any interaction with anyone. And we all, it's all, it's something we all have to kind of work on. It just comes down to, you know, treating people how you want to be treated. Exactly, yeah. I remember once you said on a post of mine that you hate money. <laughs> I hate money. <laughs> I love money. Oh, I love money. I've had this, kind, I've had this. I've had this talk with myself so many times. Am I a socialist? Am I a democratic socialist? Or am I a compassionate capitalist? I'm a compassionate capitalist. I love money. <laughs> oh man, you put green, you put green between me. I I might hug you. I love money. <laughs> but I see, but I, I do I tell you what, I do see. I'm as I'm saying this because we briefly talked about this. Um I uh I don't love money. Uh, to the point where y'all, I'm going to. I want to like employ a bunch of people, underpay them, um, boost myself up. Uh, as far as as far as um capital gain is concerned, I love money. As in, I don't want to ever be homeless no more. And I would like to be able to make a trip to Philadelphia and see some theater and not grow broke doing it. Yeah, for sure. Why do you hate money? What the heck? I hate, for that reason, I hate what it does to people is that it, you know, it, it causes a lot of greed. And I mean, the, the billionaire shouldn't exist because if you're amassing that much money, you're, you're hoarding it and you're taking it from others that need it. That money can go to help so much in society. I guess I'm a socialist. You sound like one right now. first. <laughs> Karen Alexis Greco, formerly known as Karen Alexis Crozier, is is a socialist. <clears throat> when they so start hunting us down later, you'll though this is the evidence. 
<laughs> oh no, oh no, this is will live for this will live as long as podcasts and YouTube are going. <laughs> so I'm guessing that during the 2016 election, uh you you like I did was rooting for uh for uh Mr. for Senator Sanders. Oh, absolutely. It took a whole lot of doing to get me on his side. Yeah. Yeah, you wanna know what got me on his side? What? Okay, at first I didn't know who I was gonna vote for, right? Because I was man, it I feel I feel like it was so long ago. A lot has happened. Yeah. A lot has happened. A lot, a whole lot. Um, but I was 31, right? Um, I was 31 and I was I was talk I was thinking about how back in the 90s, you know, Bill Clinton. Well, Bill Clinton was the president. Now his wife is running the president, but I wasn't privy to the crookedness of the Clintons. Mind you, I'm saying this from my perspective, as my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I like I like Ben Carson a lot. I like Ben Carson. Um, does he? He says a couple backwards things. Yeah, but um. When it comes to his story and stuff, and how, and as far as his faith, our shared Christianity and stuff, I love, I love it, I love it. Um, he seemed to be the more um, when he, whenever he wasn't talking about slavery, he he seemed to be the more sane um, person on the Republican panel. Um, Donald Trump basically set the whole world on fire. So. But then I'm walking around. So what? He set it on fire and then threw it in a garbage can. Pretty much. <laughs> so I'm walking around Winston Salem and I'm hearing so much about Bernie Sanders. I'm going to, I'm going, I go to Gil, I was going to Guilford College at the time and I hear so much Bernie, Bernie. Who in the blue heck is Bernie Sanders? Oh, this old daggone white guy. Okay. Right, another white old white dude. Yeah. Um. And then I stumbled onto a speech they gave at Liberty University, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Wait, 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 whoa, 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 pump the brakes. Liberty University is this completely far right uh, uh, Christian school. Mm -hmm. Bernie doesn't seem far right or Christian, though he does stand for a lot of things that Jesus would. He's Jewish. He is Jewish. So. Uh, so, um, so that got my attention. What he was saying caught my attention. Him praying with him caught my attention. And then I saw his interview with Killer Mike and, you know, Killer Mike, my guy. And I thought, yo, okay, okay, okay. He's saying a lot of things that, uh, Martin Luther King, when he was in his Democratic Socialist bag, was saying back in the day. Hmm. I think this guy's our best bet, yo. <laughs> and I still think that he'd be the best bet. Mm -hmm. I wish it was. I wish it was Bernie in the White House. I do too, all the time. <laughs> what drew you to him? Um, a lot of it was just what what he was trying to change, and you know, everyone calls him a progressive, but I mean, really, he's just a human being. He's just left, like the the things that he wanted was just things that we should basically have to begin with, like free health care and um, free university, free public university, um, that kind of stuff. Things that would, you know, help everyone and would benefit everyone um, and would help alleviate a lot of the stress and hardship that a lot of the country has to live with. Um, and so that that I really really appreciated, and the the fact that he was very much more this politics has gotten very like we were started on the premise of separation of church and state, and it had that has been thrown out the window, and I really uh, appreciated that he didn't run on a like this is my religious belief and this is what I will be running on. Because that's not that's forcing people to to live in your religion that aren't part of your religion. Um, so I, 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 I appreciated that about him that he was just like, listen, I just want people to 
be able to go to the doctors and, and not be afraid that they're going to go bankrupt. I want people to have access to an education that don't have to take out astronomical loans as a child and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was, I was like, yes, this is right. And I will say I used to be, you know, I used to be, unfortunately, I, 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 not unfortunately, but you know, I, I used to identify as, as Republican and I was just very much like whatever my parents are, that's what I will be. And then around the end of college, I was like, I don't agree with anything the Republican party stands for. And like actually started like listening to what, what the rhetoric was. And then I was like, yeah, I'm not a Republican. At all, my parents were like clutching their pearls, like, "Oh God, I'm no. clutching my pearls." That what you yeah. Republican? I used to be, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Booker T. Yeah. Washington is one of my heroes, and he was a Republican. Now, of course, that was way back in the. That was when uh, the parties were switched. Yeah, that was. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the Republicans was e the Republican Party was either founded by black people or founded as a response as kind of like a response to uh, slavery. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln was technically Republican, but the Republican Party that existed then is essentially the Democratic Party now. The party switched platforms in the uh, 1900s, around that time, early 1900s. I'll say I don't. I'll say I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't rock with either party. I'm rather right. certainly affiliated. But anyway, I used to be, but then I found out that I couldn't vote in primaries because of that. So I was like, mm, I guess I have to register. Oh, so you so you raised a Democrat for that reason? Yeah, so I can vote in primaries. Gotcha. Someone should fight for the right for the unaffiliated person to vote. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, we just need to get rid of the two party system in general, I think. Absolutely. But yo, you got me in my political bag. Now, nah, uh, let's do the opera. This took a totally <laughs> 180. Um, <clears throat> now tell me. Oh, dang! I cleared my throat. My my same career is okay, over. You're okay. You're okay. Okay. How how does one enter the opera the opera the the the, 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 the opera world? Ho ho! Before you tell me that, is Fam of the Opera actual opera? No. Thank you. It's not. It just takes place at an opera. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I wonder why Gerard Butler has done more musicals. I mean, the dude could sing. Now all he does is fight people. <laughs> How does one get involved in the operatic world? How were you able to uh, get into the operatic world? Uh, For me... Um, I took a very pseudo traditional path, I suppose. There are many, many ways you can get into the world. Like, just there are so many pathways you can take. Um, I, I kind of started out the traditional way, where in undergrad, I got a degree in voice performance, where I focused on classical style technique. Um, or, or European technique, I guess, is what really should be called. Um, and then um, did, did operas, did auditions for um, summer programs, kind of very similar to like summer stock kind of things in the, in the theater and musical theater world. Mm -hmm. um, and then continued on to grad school and got a degree in voice performance there. Um, did a lot of recitals, did a lot of um, uh, church jobs, um, and started doing auditioning for young artist programs, which are more elongated versions of summer stock that can be a year, two years, three years kind of thing where we get some of them, the singer gets paid to do it. Some of them, this is where people get taken advantage of in this, in this, uh, industry. Sometimes there are, well, there are a lot of of these programs that exist that are called paid to sing and you pay them to let you sing in their, in their season. And it's um, terrible. Imagine going to a job and, and paying money to go to the interview and then paying money to 
be once they're like, Hey, we'll give you the job. You have to give us $1,500 in order to come. That's, that's basically what is asked of us a lot of the time. Or come study in Europe with American singers, but pay $4,000 to do it. It's bad. It's bad. And this is why people like to think that opera is super elitist. It's because though, like, you you either are struggling, like I did, trying to be able to, like, find money and find ways to pay for this stuff. Or you just have, your parents have a lot of money and they'll pay for you to go do whatever. Um, and unfortunately, those are the people that continue on because they they don't have to worry about jobs and, and whatnot. Not to say that they're not great artists and great singers and great musicians. Um, they just have an easier time of it um, and are able to do more because of it. Um, but yeah, so I, I did that and then um, took a year off in between grad school and starting my doctorate and, and did, um, did a role in Indiana and then um, started my doctorate and just kept auditioning. It's a lot of auditioning. I was, I was jumping around all over the place, going to auditions in Ohio and Florida and oh God, New York city. I would do like 12 hour trips to New York city where I would take the bus audition and then immediately leave and come back. And it was a lot of that, a lot of, quick, you know, go audition and go back home immediately kind of stuff. Fly down to Florida, audition, and then fly back same day. And that, that's how I got into it. And the more people you you get in front of, the more they, they'll they remember you and hopefully hire you to do other things or recommend you to, to other people to do other things. So it's it's auditioning. It's, it's the performing arts. I, I imagine it's very similar in the theater world and it's definitely the same in, in the musical theater world where it's just, you're constantly auditioning and that's your full-time job until, you know, fingers crossed. Somebody's like, I'm going to take a chance on them and I'm going to pay you. <laughs> first of all, first of all, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for, um, for all that you've done. I'm, I'm not, not only that, I'm proud to say that I know you. Oh. Um, Oh, for real, I'm I'm looking at I look at all that you I look at all that you, all of that. I'm like, yo, I need to sprinkle this on that sauce on my own personal drive. <laughs> it's crazy yeah. you said it's crazy that people look at opera as elitist because it has been told to me by someone who worked at Triad Stage prior to the crazy stuff that went down with Triad Stage. If you want to make money, don't do theater. Well, oh, theater is straight up. So what? That's, I said, well, yeah, in the opera, I, I don't know what pay scales are in 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 the in the theater and musical theater world. But in opera, if you get to a certain level, you do get paid quite well. Um, but it's it's the getting there that costs you a lot of a lot of money and a lot of it's a lot of sacrifice mostly and and, and it's seen as a lead because people think it's really expensive to go see an opera and it's actually cheaper to much cheaper to go see an opera than it is to go see a football game like a lot cheaper why why you got no football out there i love i, love I can't afford to go to a football game but i can afford to go to the opera i can spend 20 bucks to see an opera i can't drop 120 dollars to see a football game it will cost you hundred twenty dollars to see the foot, the see the 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 Steelers the, lose. The Steelers lose, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I thought you were just saying that because I'm going to use a stereotype. Not many, not many theater people I know are very big in the sports. I mean, I'm not, but I mean, this is coming from I was into sports in high school, like I not football, but I was a swimmer and a soccer player in high school. So I'm into those. Um, but <laughs> I'm a basketball it guy. Is generally, it is much cheaper. I am too. And so I'm not, I'm not commenting on your, your Tar Heels lanyard. I'm not saying anything. What? Who's your, hold up. Hold up. Time out. Time out. I'm a Duke fan. What? This is okay. This interview's over. I'm <laughs> 
world you go to Appalachian State and end up how you go how you go from Appalachian Mountaineer to being raised with the Wake Forest Demon Deacons and end up coming out a dookie. Well, because App doesn't have a good basketball team and neither does Wake. But Duke does. And that's like from the moment I moved to Winston-Salem. I'm not a bandwagon fan. The moment I moved to Winston-Salem, I was a Duke fan. I knew God told me to leave with his <laughs> lanyard on. I knew it. Just someone was saying, Adrian, keep the lanyard on. <laughs> and this is why. <sighs> no, you know hate, no, no hate. Now that I've like moved away, it's a little bit less. I, I don't really follow the 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 sports ball over in North Carolina so much anymore, but she just says sports ball. <laughs> <laughs> the sports ball. I don't have time. <laughs> Speaking of time, how much more do I have? Uh, how much longer do I have? Um, I have a meeting at five that I have to leave for, but I've got a little bit. It's just right up the road, so it's not a big deal. Okay, like just making sure. Yeah, just make sure. We want to be we want to be respectful of your time yeah, here on Eighty Years Renaissance. We are very respectful of our uh, guest host's time. Um. <laughs> So, uh, so tell me this, tell me this, what goes in, how do you prepare for a role? Yeah, I got it. Ooh, how do you prepare for a role? Cause I want to know how to prepare for a role. Once I get into the opera, you know, once Kanye West, write another, write, write another opera and I go out. He's yeah. Opera. How do you prepare for an opera? I'm going to grab a score so you can kind of see what I do. Okay. Let's see what I got here. Um. And while she's grabbing that score, you're tuning into ADQ's Renaissance. I'm ADQ. This young lady uh, grabbing the score uh, is Karen Alexis Greco. Okay, this is my this is my check score. Um, so for the all y'all who know who know check, I don't know check. Only check yeah. I know is cash this. <laughs> cash that check. Um, it is, and I had a friend borrow this score so it is all kinds of marked up um so basically i go through and i did not translate this one as much as i do here we go yeah okay so this is what this is what check looks like this is the male role that i played one time um so i go through and i write how to pronounce it down here and it's the International Phonetic Alphabet. It helps you pronounce literally anything. Mm -hmm. And then I translate it up here. So I know what I'm singing about because this translation is not correct. Um, and then I go through, I highlight my part. I highlight any like any extra things that happen that the composer is telling me. Tempo, dynamic, any crescendos or decrescendos. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through and, um, basically it's all where I pop in is marked. Um, and I'll go through and write, um, uh, go through the rhythms first, speaking the words, uh, I'll speak them in rhythm. So I have that feeling in my, in my, in my mouth. Um. And then I'll go through and I'll sing the the melody, not on words, but on like a, a lip trill, which is like a, mm. or um, on like a random vowel or something. Um, and sing that a few times, kind of slow down. Then I will, in that slower tempo, add the words. And then I will check tempo and bring it up to tempo or extra slow it down if it's a lot slower. And then it's just like systematic from there. Um, I'll usually take it to my, my own voice teacher and um, work through some trouble spots to kind of check technique, see if I'm doing anything kind of funky. Um, and then I'll work with it um, with a coach who um, basically will help with interpretation and check my diction and make sure that that I'm saying everything correctly or if I need to change a vowel to kind of fit the um, contour of the melodic line or anything like that. Um, and all of that, depending on the size of the role, can take anywhere from 
um, like th this the this was this was an opera that I did three rolls out of. Um, two of them were small, so they it that took maybe a couple weeks, two to three weeks, to kind of get it all in my body and in my mind. Um, the larger roll will take me about a month, month and a half to kind of work through on my own. And then, then when you get to the actual thing, it's, it's about two weeks, uh, two to three weeks of staging. And then you do the thing. Mm. So pretty much, uh, you have to, so pretty much you have to meticulously, um, break down what the composer is demanding in your role. Um, mm -hmm. Rely upon your understanding of the language, which me, of course, I'm going to start start with English. Um, running by running by some running by a superior of yours. Work on it. Work on it. Uh, work on it like uh, tirelessly. Mm hmm. And be and be ready to rock and roll come open the night. Yeah, you got to show up to the first rehearsal memorized. When's the uh, when? Is, when's usually the first? Does it vary by production? Uh, when the re first rehearsal is, um, um, after 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 being cast. Yeah. So when we're when we've auditioned and we're offered a role, um, it kind of goes back and forth for a little bit, kind of negotiating, um time and price like negotiating the contract and then um then at that point we'll know exactly when the first rehearsal is um and usually you have a if it's if it if this whole process took like kind of the traditional route of we audition for the season typically in late spring early summer and then usually it'll be in the fall when we would um, be needed for rehearsals um so we'll have a couple months to work on stuff um, before we, we get to where we need to be. Um, sometimes it can be really quick. Um, I, I actually just had to, um, drop out of a production because it was, it was too quick of a, a turnaround. And I, I, with my teaching schedule, I, I would have no time to, to practice. <laughs> and it was a song time. It would have been a musical, Adrian. It would have been a musical. It was a song time musical. <laughs> Which, which one? What's our high musical? Which Passion. one? Passion. Passion. Not done very often, but it's really beautiful music. Might have to check out the soundtrack to it. It's beautiful. It's crazy. It's like a love triangle, and it's it's the one that um, sometimes did the music and the words. So it's it's really cool. Do you ever see your? Do you see yourself writing anything uh, original one day? Oh God, no. <laughs> that is not my wheelhouse is not in that at all i do a lot of new music so i'll perform a lot of stuff and i have a lot of friends who are composers um and i really enjoy um bringing helping them bring stuff to life they're they're let them actually hear it in a in a human um and i really enjoy working through that kind of stuff but i do not have the tools or the mind to to do something like that i have the mind to do that i have the words to do it unfortunately i don't know how to play an instrument but i'm going to latch i'm going to latch on to i'm going to uh, get with a composer one day and set the world on fire just like uh just like Lemon in 2016 Lemon Manuel Miranda and Donald Trump set the world on fire yeah so yeah, that's what I'm going. Uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Do it. What, what? Um, I say um too much. Excuse oh, me. You're good. It's okay. I want to ask you, what is the art scene? I know the art. I know the art scene in Philly. What? Sorry. Well, I'm not sorry for this, but anyway. <laughs> Flashing the lamp. What does uh the art scene in uh Philly uh in Pittsburgh looked like because Pittsburgh is known for its steel and it's known for sports. You know the uh, the 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 Bruins. No, not the Bruins. Uh, show. Uh, I don't follow hockey like that. The Penguins. The hockey team in Pittsburgh. Whoever they are. Penguins. 
Yeah, the penguins, the uh oh my god, Blues, the pirates. The, yeah, the pirates. The pirates. Excuse me. Ah, I'm having 30, I'm having 37 moments right now. You're good. It's it's 4 30. It's that time of day. I need a cup of coffee. Yeah, I was about to, I was thinking about working out after this. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. <laughs> But my but my point, what I'm getting to is, um, it's a steel city. It's no, it's a sports city. What uh, what's the arts? What's the art scene like? There's a thriving art scene. The um, the August Wilson Theater Company is in Pittsburgh. What the? Oh my God! Hold up! Time out! Time out! Time out! Mm -hmm. I had to apologize. I'm so sorry, August Wilson. August Wilson is my <laughs> man. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so they're yeah, a yeah, theater that's company. Awesome. Yeah, they filmed Fences here. And that's because yeah. all of his plays takes place in Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh uh -huh. cycle. What in the world is uh -huh. wrong with me? Yep, yep. So, uh, that's, yep. so that's one of the larger theater companies. There's a huge um, musical theater company. The, um, the There's a, 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 a Pittsburgh like classic theater company, I think is the PCT, I think. Um, there's a regional opera company here. There's a lot of small, um, opera companies, um, around there's smaller kind of community theaters. I mean, it's, it's a very, very, very artistic town. There's always something going on. Very, lots of things going on. I'm so mad at myself for forgetting about August was I had a couple <laughs> on lots. Okay, so I have to remember that if what yeah. if destiny happens to like push me to Pittsburgh, because anybody who knows me knows that I would love to uh, take up residency in Philadelphia. How far is Pittsburgh from Philadelphia? Uh, four, maybe five hours. Have you ever been up the Rocky Steps? No. I've never oh. been to Philadelphia. What? Yeah. You live in the same state. You've never been to Philadelphia? Um, this state is like the longest state ever. Philadelphia may as well state. be like on a total in a totally different world. It is okay. far away. Okay, well, I wanted to I was in Philadelphia. I wanted to run with the Rocky Steps. Yeah. I wanted to scream out. Adrian, and then yeah. out, what? <laughs> Do it. I will one day. I will. At least got a good art scene too. Oh yes, okay. I saw the Wilma Theater yeah. when I was um, uh, trying to when I was interviewing for um, um, acceptance to the University of the Arts. Mm -hmm. Didn't get in, but I did get to see um, the art the art scene in Philadelphia. It's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of um, a lot of movies and TV shows are are shot here as well, a lot, and they I pay know. up here. They pay your the extras to be in movies and TV shows. I'll have to remember that. Yeah. So the chances of you um, um, relocating your artistic endeavors back down here in North Carolina are slim to none, right? It, I go where the jobs are. If I get a teaching job down there, then we'll go. But. Just depends on where the jobs are. If you get a teaching job down here, and that means you and your, you and your husband will have to uproot and move down here. If I was your uh, your husband, better be like, no, we stay here. He, you know, we met at at App State, so he's very familiar with uh, North. Car he's from New York, but uh, he's very familiar with North Carolina. I would actually. I'm manifesting this. I would love more than anything to go back to app and teach at app. Love that. Love okay, so first she's a Duke fan. Now she wants to. Uh, I would teach, teach at Duke at too, but they don't have. I could be wrong, but I think they have a really small music department. I don't um, know if they have a music department, but I know they have a. I know they have a fire uh, theater department because. Um, my um my uh my uh advisor 
when I went to Foresight Tech, uh, he was a he went to grad school at Duke. And I think he had at one point taught at Duke, right? But he did that right before studying in Russia over at the Chekhov over at the Chekhov Theater. Mm-hmm. I would look at him come to class and teach, and I'm like, and he would wear a Duke shirt. I'm like, how do you expect from me? A lifelong Carolina fan to take you ser- to take anything you have to say seriously, <laughs> and wearing that garbage. <laughs> but you know, we only have one life to live, so whatever it is live that it you, you choose. So what? Live it how you choose, as long as you're happy. Live it how you choose, as long as you're happy. Absolutely, and uh, hearing all this about you, I. Really wish that y'all was in North Carolina. Well, for uh, let me t- t- let me let me uh, ask you let me ask you this. Um, what does your what does your husband do? What field is he involved in? Music as well. He's a percussionist. Oh, nice. So he does. Um, he teaches at a, at a university um, about an hour west of here in West Virginia. Um, and he teaches a lot of um. <laughs> uh steel pan so he, he uh from trinidad and tobago and he he studied for a long time with the the master drummer of ghana so he teaches um a lot of west african drum and dance as well and um uh tabla which is a an indian instrument that's really cool so 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 the thing that was all of that ooh, powerful powerful even i you know you know i'm trying to learn uh west african um west african drum patterns and stuff but that's a big one okay so here <laughs> Okay, so here on ADQ Renaissance, here on ADQ's Renaissance, a, ca- a Caucasian woman was able to um, uh, display African drum and better than the actual African man. Yes, this this just happened. A, a Caucasian woman who cheers with Duke. <laughs> it's such a beautiful culture, and it's such such a um, it's just such incredible music. Well, you know that's where musical that's where musical originated. Yes, exactly. So, um, so let's see. So, you want to teach at App State? Mm-hmm. So, what is the mu- What the what the heck? <sighs> Try this again. Take two. Action. <laughs> what does the future hold for? As Dave Wills once said, the Karen. <sighs> Dave did not say that. Look, way no. back at one of our Susa Cool yeah. cast parties, he said something about there's no touching the Karen or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. That's that's ridiculous. <laughs> I just remember um, him saying the Karen. <laughs> the Karen. <laughs> uh, I have no idea um, what that is about. Um... <laughs> Uh, what is, man, this, this got asked of me in my interview today too. Um, what is, what is next for me? I, my, my vision for myself, um, when I'm all grown up is, uh, to be teaching full time and also have a very active, uh, performing career is the goal is the ideal goal. Um, so I'm gonna keep fighting. That's it's exhausting to do that, but I, you know, I gotta. I'm gonna teach the youngins how to uh, how to sing and what life is like performing. Then I gotta be doing it too. So that's the goal: teaching and singing. Ain't that kind of like what you do now? It is, but I, I would like to do it at more of a high caliber. Gotcha. Now. Well, from your mouth to from your mouth to God's ears, watch what happens. I happens. Watch what happens. Uh, I know you still got. I know you still got some of them. Loop, I know you got the Lutheran play, prayers all up in. 
I never been to a Lutheran church. What are they like? Um, I I uh, the very traditional, I guess. I don't know. It's 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 Catholic light, so it's oh wow, oh wow, you know, it's the uh, first Protestant denomination. It's that the Lutherans are who broke away from the Catholic Church. So I, it's very catholic mass like and in some of them and some of them it's not i don't know it just i, I imagine it's just like any other domination there are some that are are more um like high church i guess and european church and some that are a little bit more relaxed i i don't know i don't know how to describe what our services are like <laughs> they're very catholic like but not catholic I've never been to a Catholic church, but I can say that I grew up in the Black Baptist church, and you know they'd be in, they'd be up in, we'd be up in the jam, yo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not like that. It's not like that. I wish it was. We don't clap. We don't clap. We don't make sounds. The choir sings, and then we're greeted by silence. That's okay. Hey, you know. Whatever times you went to the wall, my you know, that is. That, that's you know, it's very structured. So and that's that, that is what it is. It's fine. It's your uh, do your thing. Do your thing. Yeah. Well, hey, yo, I see. Uh, you will definitely come into a future where you will be teaching and um performing and stuff at the highest caliber ever, and you will at some point. I'm putting this into your life, Karen. You it. will act in a straight play one day. One day, I would like to do it. Like, yo, you memorize your lessons and stuff before you teach, right? Well, my lessons are very. Uh, it's, since they're one on one, it's it's very just. What am I working on with the student today? I mean, you do one on one in a scene. But I mean, I have to memorize, you know, another language. I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you memorize. You might you memorize Czech. I mean, what other yeah. language you memorize? Oh, we have to do, so the standard languages are English, Italian, German, and French, and more and more, it's uh, Russian and, and Czech are becoming uh, more standard, and Spanish. If you could memorize all of that and recite them in front of people, yeah. doing a straight play is nothing, yo. <laughs> I believe in you, Karen. Okay, thanks. I believe in you. Thank you. I don't know why you believe in me, but thank you. Look, because you're you've come so far from when we first met. You've been making things happen. You've been performing more, and you're making it happen. You've got a podcast. <laughs> well, um, also, thank you. You're doing big things. Thank you. I mean, you know, I, I'm just on almost every single of uh, podcast site where podcasts can be found, and this is my 126th episode. And um, you know, to God be the glory. I say that. But, there you go. Thank you. There you go. Pre- thank you. I appreciate that, Karen. You know, hey, um, greatness recognize greatness, and you know, I recognize you. You recognize me. When, last question though: When you got when do you see yourself headed towards the old north state yet again? The Tar Heel, the Tar Heel state yet again. Uh, I'll be in Greensboro in April, I believe. For a, I'm tagging along for a percussion conference with my okay. husband. So we should we should be down uh, beginning of April, I think. Did I tell you that I live in Greensboro? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we should catch up. Be like, yo, yeah, absolutely. Man, how do you do this African drumming thing? I, uh, I'm i African and I can't do it. I embarrass my ancestors. No, there are people actually all over Winston-Salem that uh, that do um, and, and teach West African drum and dance. I'm sure there are some in Greensboro. Absolutely. You just got to find it. Got to find it. We've got, there's a few people, a few groups um, here in Pittsburgh that do a lot of um, West African. They do mostly uh, Nigerian, which is pretty cool. Um, it's cool to kind of learn a little bit different 
Well, maybe I well maybe I'll start looking for them after I, you know, finish with this battle of, after I finish with Battle of the Books, which is going up on May March nineteenth, twenty twenty two, Van Dyke Performance Space, Greensboro. Um, unless you're unless you're in another country, you need to be there. Yeah, you too. Be there. You know what? Anyone who's in, anyone who's in another country need to be there as well. But anyway, Karen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for y'all. Thank you so much for um showing me love of when I was in when we did Susan Cole because I'm telling you, I was scared to death. You never showed it. Huh? You never showed it. I mean show my act of, you know, uh, uh <laughs> But now, like I just, I, I remember back in Seuss. I remember when we did Seuss is Cool. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to find my theater legs. You know, keep on rapping, which uh, I do. I still do. Uh, uh, I still do as a hobby. But theater is where I sit at. I just wanted to like fit in the theater scene, fit in the theater culture, and do what I can do. Do what I can could do to add to it and and help enrich me and enrich it. Now. Now, when I walk in, now when I look back at that, I don't want to be one of only two black people in Sioux School again. Absolutely. But I'm looking at these plays and stuff, and I'm seeing so much more people who look like me and people who look like you getting together and making beautiful art together. That's important. It is. And thank you for telling me what is and what is it. Last question, last question. This is my last question. Last okay. question. I wanted to name these instances real quick. I want you to tell me whether or not they're sexes, okay? <laughs> Rapid fire. Do what? Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Here it goes. Okay. It's an old school thing for a guy and a woman. If there's if they for for a guy and a woman, if they're walking on the side, if they're walking on the sidewalk. The man tells the woman, and I tell this with with little girls. Let me put that in context. My students, little girls, grown women I'm dating, even older women who I love like mother figures. I have them get on the inside, and I have myself close to the traffic. Is that sexist? I don't think so. My <clears throat> my husband does that to me all the time. He's like, "You walk on the inside." Um, <laughs> I think that's just uh, uh, I, I don't see that as sexist at all. I think I see that more as a, a, a someone protecting someone. Yeah, because there's this little girl in my class. She's like six years old. Every time I jokingly say that I'm going to go to the North Pole, she runs and grabs my arm. And when we're and like when we're walking on when we're walking to lunch and, and stuff, I say, you know what, you get right here, and I'm going to say right here, all right? Um. Holding the door for someone. I think that's not, I think anyone should hold the door for anyone. I hold doors open for men. If there's someone behind me and I'm going through a door, I'm going to hold it open for them as well. I just think that's something that's common courtesy. Anyone should do that, no matter if you're a man or a woman. Okay, okay. Uh, do I have anything else? <sighs> Expressing how much I don't like. Uh, this might. I hope this don't step on your Democratic toes too bad. But expressing how much I dislike Kamala Harris, Hillary Clinton, and Nancy Pelosi. Well, I mean, as long as you don't like them just because they're women. No, no. It's it's fine. You're allowed to not like someone as long as it's not because of their their gender. I love Asata Shakur and Erica Badu, and I mean the, the Erica Badu. Oh God. I will marry her. And, uh, I love Asata Shakur. She's a woman. Um, shoot, I love all, all, all of the women who served as Black Panthers. They women. I think, that, I think that women have every ability to do um, that a man does, that a man could do. Even produce sperm, just in a different way. Yeah, you cannot like them or agree with their their, you know, views of the world or their ideals just, you know as long as you're not liking someone because of you know how they identify 
is, I don't think that's sexist. Because there are people that don't like them because the, they are women and they don't think women should speak out and that kind of stuff. That exists, but, you know, that would be sexist. I, you heard it here first from ADQ's Renaissance. I look forward to the day when a woman can be crowned the president of the United States. Oh, me too. So bad. <laughs> Just not Hillary Clinton or Kamala Harris. <laughs> if I had been thinking right, I would have voted for Jill Stein. Mm. But she's out there somewhere. Somewhere. It, you know, in our lifetime, I would very much like to see that. Maybe she'll be you. Oh, oh God. <laughs> hey, Trump said that. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, Karen, yo, it has been great chopping up with you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Gotta have, you Gotta have you back sometime. Also, also, hopefully one day we could collab in some yeah. form. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Thank this you. has been ADQ's Renaissance. I'm ADQ. That's Karen Alexis Greco, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you all for watching. Peace.